let's get going again here. Session 12C. Of course, the greatest example of walking by the Spirit and wielding the power of God was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm now going to share with you an incredible snapshot of how our Lord's walked by revelation. Wayne shared from John 11, and I'm going to share from John 18. God showed his son many events ahead of time for what we call Holy Week. In John 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil now having put into the heart of Jesus, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, verse 3, Jesus knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, then it goes on with the rest of the chapter. So Jesus knew a lot. We're going to see how much he knew. God told Jesus a whole lot of things ahead of time. And this can happen for us, too. I know of a woman who has previewed everything she was supposed to say for a phone call to minister to someone. And she called him up, and everything happened as it was foretold. It was like she was following a script that God had previewed for her. And the woman was healed. In John 13, verse 1 through 3, it sets the stage for the sermon in the valley but soon after he delivered that sermon Jesus was arrested and in the chaotic moments of that confrontation everything could have been lost his apostles could have been arrested with him or worse but Jesus managed that situation in order to achieve the goal that his apostles be spared and John 18 tells of this incident and there are other contributing details from the rest of the Gospels that allow us to see a lot of the details. John 18, verse 1. John 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden unto which he entered and his disciples. So that's why I call John 13 through 17 the Sermon in the Valley, because part of it, was given as they went down the hill into the valley. So you have the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, Sermon in the Valley. You have that symmetry. Verse 2, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, see, God previewed it for him, went forth and said to him, Whom seek ye? See, Jesus received guidance from the Father about this impending situation, and he was thoroughly prepared. Now, some may think that the arrest of Jesus was an ugly event, but there's a lot more to it. It's a lesson on preparedness by revelation. See, first of all, this handoff of Jesus to them had to occur because Jesus had to die for us, right? And they were going to have to do it. Well, how is he going to make that happen unless he's in their possession? So it was a pivotal event between light and darkness. See, before this, Jesus had avoided potentially dangerous situations because it wasn't time yet. Remember that they were trying to throw him off the hilltop at Nazareth and he just sort of melded into the crowd and got away. But now it was time to surrender himself to the adversary's minions and let them do their dirty deeds. But even this had to be done right because if things went wrong in those chaotic moments, all could be lost. His apostles could be arrested, injured, or even killed. So he was prepared. And earlier that day, Jesus had made an unusual request to his followers. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And he said to them in verse 35, Luke 22, 35, And he said to them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. 
He's talking about when he sent them out two by two. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And otherwise his scrip, his shepherd sack, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So he's saying, hey, guys, pack up your suitcases and, and get a sword. <laughs> For I say unto you that this is written, that you must be accomplished in me, that he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, all right, that's enough. So obviously the situation had changed from months earlier when they had gone out two by two. In Matthew 10, 10, he said, don't take a script or your shepherd's bag and don't pack a suitcase, in other words. The earlier guidance did not apply now. Um, and then they, and then he gave this this strange request to get a sword. Now many portray Jesus as a pacifist, and quote what Jesus said soon thereafter that those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. But but they don't acknowledge that just a few hours earlier, before he had said that, Jesus recommended that they get swords. Why? Jesus was preparing his people to be both ready to fight and to flee and have their possessions, their person bag, intact. He received revelation and needed to produce the right balance of deterrent with the swords and be ready with the right words and actions so that after the dust cleared, his apostles and even their possessions would be safe. Why? so his ministry could survive. Now, think about this. A mob was coming to arrest Jesus that night with torches and clubs and swords. They were the Jewish temple guards. They were the Jewish militia. It was the equivalent of a SWAT team. Now, do you mess with SWAT teams? <laughs> well, I think every arrestee that's ever been confronted by one will give you the same answer. <laughs> Don't try it. So how would you like to be in charge like Jesus was and have to pull this off? Your assignment is that none of the apostles be harmed in those uncontrollable moments that are going to inevitably arrive soon. And Jesus couldn't say, just take me, because the apostles were viewed as his accomplices. Do you think that the adversary wanted to take this opportunity to totally crush his movement? by not only arresting and ultimately killing Jesus, but also taking his entourage as well. I, an overwhelming mob was on its way, led by Judas. But Jesus took charge. He didn't let the adversary have his way. He didn't let the situation get out of control like it could very well have at any second and ruin everything he'd built. See, God thoroughly prepared his son by revelation. How much did Jesus know ahead of time? Well, John 13, 1 said, all things were in his hands. John 13, 3 declared that he knew his hour was come. In John 18, 4, it says, he knew all things that should come upon him. Do you think he and God had had some conversations and his father had showed him some stuff? We're going to see how well informed Jesus was by revelation ahead of time. His father indeed had given him comprehensive preparation. So Jesus boldly took the initiative when the mob showed up and right when the raid began Jesus stepped forth bravely and spoke. What see, whom seek ye? I mean he wasn't going to cower behind his supporters like a criminal because he had revelation and he acted courageously Look at John 18, verse 5. They answered him, he answered them, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Wow. And then he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Wow. What a presence Jesus had. I mean, that was quite unusual, don't you think? That when he identified himself 
the mob reacted the way they did? They fell backward? Well, why was that? Well, it wasn't because he said some magic words like I am, like some people say. In fact, he didn't even say I am because you can't say that in Aramaic. <laughs> There's no such word as am in biblical Aramaic or biblical Hebrew. Uh, so that he can't say what they want to fit um, Exodus 3.14. And that's a mistranslation anyway. I covered that in the One God of the Original Christianity class. So there had to be some other reason they fell backward. I mean, were there some in that raiding party who expected this to be a cakewalk because they thought Jesus was a pacifist? And to rethink and fall back and take a different strategic position because swords were there. They were being brandished and Jesus came forth boldly. Do you think they might have had to reconnoiter, had to figure something out? So they fell backward. Now, somebody could, you could postulate all kinds of scenarios explaining why they fell. But let's take a look at the facts. Let them explain. Who was in this mob? It was a hastily assembled group of the temple guards and priests' servants. See, Judas had told the high priests where they could find Jesus and when, away from the crowds, so they had to act quickly and with whosoever was available. But also, these were not soldiers and killers. They were the high priest's dedicated and hand-picked security detachment and the temple guards. They weren't a bunch of thugs. In fact, they were a select group of Levites. They were trusted believers, loyal to the high priest, and dedicated to defend the, the temple. But they also knew who they were sent out to arrest it's very probable some of them in this detachment may have even been in the crew that had been sent out earlier to arrest Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles six months earlier and had come back saying, uh, empty-handed saying, no man has ever spoken like this man. <laughs> but even if they weren't involved back then, they those people in the temple guard certainly had heard about that incident. Also, the temple guards were Levites. They were men of integrity. They had witnessed the greatest teachers of their time because they were on guard during the daily temple service. They'd heard the word of God taught by the best in first century Judaism. So do you think that some of them may have had mixed feelings about this, this hastily organized late evening assignment? See, I think the fact that they fell backward reveals a lot about their state of mind that night. Furthermore, this Jesus was the same one who had just made triumphal entries into Jerusalem in which many of the crowd declared that he was the Messiah. Do you think there were some in that group and that mob who were wondering if that was really true? I mean, would he rain fire down upon them like happened with Elijah and the sets of 50s who had come to arrest him? <laughs> you know what? I think that's what Judas really wanted to happen. I think Judas believed that Jesus was Messiah, but he was not acting Messiah-like enough. He believed in the military Messiah. Judas wanted to be the finger of God to precipitate a confrontation between Jesus and the high priest that he thought Jesus would certainly win. Judas wanted to bring on the millennial kingdom, but it doesn't work if you try to be the finger of God because the the hand of God is against you. Everyone has ever tried to be the finger of God that's happened. So put yourself in those guard sandals. How would you feel if you were roped into that hastily organized nighttime assignment? A bit tentative? And so you come upon him to arrest him, and when you, you ask which one it is that you're asking, you're seeking, and Jesus boldly stepped forth, and then there's, there's swords glinting in the background. And he declares, he's the one you seek. You, you seek. Well, what's going to happen next? Well, you, you just lost your momentum. Wouldn't you be nervous? I think that in part explains the reaction. Jesus was so courageous, they were totally taken aback. What's his strategy? See, But for those who have eyes to see, there also is a spiritual explanation for what just happened. Those of us who walk with power and are aware of the spiritual battle going on around us often see whispers of its effects. Sometimes even as we're simply walking down the street, speaking in tongues silently, 
we see people inexplicably turn and run. <laughs> While I was originally researching and writing about this account in my Path into Eternity book, a fellow minister recounted an incident to me when he was just walking toward two individuals approaching from the opposite direction, and God whispered in his ear, Watch this. <laughs> and as they passed, one of them fell down to the ground. He told me that incident. Then, why? Because I was researching this chapter in this for, for this chapter in my book, and I needed to figure out what happened in John 18, and God needed to clue me on what happened. I think the spiritual explanation of what there was some in that evil mod were controlled by satanic spirits. Jesus certainly did have the authority to mind such things like he had many times before. I mean, if he'd previously been able to prevent the spirits from speaking, he certainly could have bound them in this dire situation. So when they fell to the ground, I think it was actually indicating that Jesus had spiritually cut out their satanic legs out from underneath them. And now they were coming to him as natural man with no dark spiritual powers in assist. See, <laughs> that's a spiritual socket to you. And that's available. So, events were about to unfold quickly, but throughout the melee that followed, Jesus still bravely and decisively managed things to get the results he wanted because God had informed him ahead of time by revelation. Because of the comprehensive guidance he received, he was actually able to take charge of his own arrest. That's incredible, but true. And by means of the right sequence of commands and actions, he achieved the desired result that he was taken, but the apostles were allowed to go free. Wow. So the next scriptures occur in quick succession. Luke 22, Luke 22, verse 52. Luke 22, 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out against as against a thief with swords and clubs? When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Mark 14, verse 48. Mark 14, verse 48. And Jesus answered and said to them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Luke 22 49 when they were with him about him saw what would follow they said unto him lord shall we smite with the sword and john 18 verse 10 then simon peter having a sword drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear and the servant's name was malchus now <laughs> the details in this account speak volumes the apostles only had two swords with them now logically they would have been given to the members of the group who knew how to use them and peter wielded one <laughs> one attribute of peter peter which has rarely been recognized was that because he was a fisherman he had to be in excellent physical shape i mean hauling the nets and rowing would have made him quite muscular and also of course Peter was an alpha type personality. He was a man's man. So if if I were if I were in a fight, I want Peter on my side. And apparently he was quite proficient with the sword. How so? Well, who did he fight and defeat? It was the high priest's servant, who was at the head of that mob. You know, a, a better term instead of servant might be bodyguard. I mean, I don't think they would have chosen the high priest kosher chef for this SWAT team. All right. Now, also, we cannot imagine this sword fight to be like Hollywood portrays. John Clements in his article, Sword Fighting is Not What You Think, said, quote, historically in the vast majority of cases, a real sword fight was decided and ended with the first blow struck and office often took less than 30 seconds. So, imagine the effect on the mob 
to see their champion defeated, the high priest bodyguard, in such a terrible manner, bleeding profusely from a head wound with his ear cut off by a fisherman. That detail is important because he cut off his right ear. Okay? His opponent was probably right-handed. So, to do that to his dominant side would have been a psychological blow, and every fighting man who was in that mob realized it. Who was this Peter the Rock fella from up north in hillbilly country? Was he in Holy Spirit assist mode? Hmm. <laughs> This certainly took them aback, as any planned deterrent should, except, you know, this is spiritually planned, but as in any altercation, the moment that blood is shed, the situation immediately becomes much worse and harder to control. Jesus recognized this, and amazingly, he immediately stopped things from going further. The sword deterrent had worked its effect. That's why he said, bring swords. God had told him. That's why they brought them. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 52. Then said Jesus unto them, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Then, verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Woo! Woe, Nellie! I bet those those who feared fire from heaven were quaking in their boots or in their sandals. Uh, I bet for some of them there was pee running down their leg. <laughs> John chapter 18, verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? See? Wow. The sword fight had just ended and things that could have uh, quickly gotten out of hand, because imagine this in today's terms. The SWAT team had deployed, and their adversaries had injured one of their officers. Well, what would you expect to follow? Immediate carnage. Shots fired, shots fired. Officer down, officer down. Fire at will. Those officers who work together and know each other, if one of their own is harmed, that would be a turning point in any altercation. When that whole confrontation changes character, and it gets really serious from that point. Once shot or, shots are fired and a comrade injured, the unspoken rule usually is shoot to kill. Now, notwithstanding they were using swords instead of guns, the thing would be true. And in the next few moments, the confrontation could have quickly degenerated into an all-out fight with clubs and swords, and many of the apostles could have been killed or maimed or arrested and all that Jesus had built with his ministry come to a violent end. But wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. A miracle now occurs. Luke twenty two fifty one. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye this far. It's enough. Stop, stop. And he touched his ear and healed him. <laughs> Incredibly. Jesus commanded a halt to the conflict and miraculously healed the high priest's servant's ear in full view of everyone. That instantaneously diffused the adrenaline surge, hearts pounding, sword drawn crowd. That miracle saved the apostles and his ministry. Wow. Throughout this incident, we can easily see that Jesus had such a presence because he had thorough revelation and he was able to manage his own arrest. That's amazing. He was even able to tell the mob what to do and they did it. <laughs> Let his apostles escape and they obeyed him. And the apostles and Christianity survived. John 18, verse 8 and 9. Jesus answered, Have I told you that I am he? If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them which thou gavest me. I have lost none. And in Mark 14, verse 50, it says, And they all forsook him and fled. 
I mean, when Jesus had been taken captive by the high priest guards, all could have been lost. The apostles could have been arrested or worse, and the ministry that Jesus had built destroyed. Because they needed to be free for his movement to carry on. Uh, Jesus accomplished that incredible feat, and they even took their possessions with them. How could this happen? Well, Jesus got revelation ahead of time, plus a few miracles occurred. The mob falling backward, Peter waxing Samson-esque, <laughs> and Jesus healing the high priest's bodyguard's ear. Well, Lord, open our eyes. Let us see what we and you can do and prevail in any situation in this dark world. In closing, during my teaching itineraries, customarily I stay in the guest rooms of the people who have invited me to come and teach, and that often affords time for me to fellowship and minister to them and talk and teach them stuff and one-on-one. -on -one. And in one of those conversations, one of my hosts confided in me something they said that they had told to only two other people. They were driving their car on a country road down a hill, approaching a curve to the right. When they're at the curve, suddenly there's a car approaching, driving around the curve, coming straight at them, head on. It was unavoidable, right there. It was on top of them. They couldn't do anything. Yes. Of all the millions and millions of possibilities, God brought me to the person who was driving the other car. <laughs> I immediately recognized the serendipity of that. And I listened wide-eyed as they told me they did not close their eyes. They cried out to the Lord for help with their eyes open, and they told me they saw themselves and their car pass through the oncoming vehicle like it was transparent glass. Hallelujah, sock to you. What a miracle. Do you need deliverance from any situation? No matter how dire, we have an awesome God who has unfathomable power, who can do anything. <laughs> We've certainly learned about that in this class on the Holy Spirit. So, what's on your prayer list? Lord, open our eyes. Bless you.